Welcome to Come Follow Me Week 6, which covers the chapters 2 Nephi 1 and 2, which means that this may be slightly shorter than the other series. 2 Nephi chapter 1 is basically a restate of what has just been said in 1 Nephi, and that is because Joseph is now using the voice of Lehi to reiterate the things which have been said about the promised land and about the seed of Laban and Lemuel, and particularly Nephi. And there are a few things to be aware of. Firstly, you see that the promised land has been chosen and kept apart from other nations so that it can be a land of inheritance for people who are righteous and led there by God. And we can see that there's no room in these scriptures for an idea that there's a populated American continent that the Lamanites and the Lephites are coming into. There is nobody there. The people that are there are being led by God, and this is their inheritance. This is stated in the text. So the fact that we now have that there is no Lamanite or Israelite DNA in Native Americans is a real problem because the text states this is their inheritance. And so we're talking about Lamanites. We're talking about the seed of Lehi. And Lehi is being explicit that the American continent would be overrun by other people if it wasn't kept sacred and apart from the old world. And so there just is no room in the text to suggest that there's anybody else here except for the, those who the Lord has brought. And that presumably is the Jaredites who are already here and are dying out. And now the Lamanites and the Nephites, the seed of Lehi. And from verse 10 on, we see this reiteration that this nation and the people in it, the Lamanites, are going to be overtaken by the righteous Gentiles who are going to come from the old world, and their inheritance is going to surpass the Lamanites. And in fact, it's going to be that they're going to come and scatter and smitten the Lamanites, and it's going to cause a lot of bloodshed. And as I've stated before, this is incredibly racist because it says that the Native Americans are not worthy of the land and that the Lord has cast them aside and now they're going to be displaced by the Europeans. And the Native Americans are going to be cursed. They're going to be led by the devil. They're going to suffer the sword and famine. And, you know, this is going to be done because this is what the Lord in his righteousness will do. So we're faced with an incredibly painful, racist God who's going to take away this pe these people's inheritance and supplant them because they are cursed. And Lehi is going to instruct his children and also justify to Laban and Lemuel why they are so bad, why their seed is going to be wiped out, and it's because they're not listening to God. But Lehi is going to reiterate that Nephi is the chosen, that he's done all the things right. And again, this is a metaphor for Joseph. Joseph is the chosen, and he's the one that you should listen to and follow. And in verse 25, we see this restatement from Lehi that Nephi is the righteous one that you've accused him of wanting authority, but that's not true. He's just doing the will of God. And these are the same accusations that are being leveled against Joseph Smith in June of 1829. And so it's autobiographic. Joseph is using Lehi's voice to restate again the case for Joseph. And verse 26 is particularly interesting because he uses the word sharpness, which is being used at the same time in the Doctrine and Covenants sections 15 and 16 with John Whitmer and Peter Whitmer saying to them that they need to heed to Joseph as well. So there's this correlation between what is happening in the Book of Mormon and what is happening in the Doctrine and Covenants at the same time with the same language. And lastly, there's a plea from Lehi to listen to Nephi. Laban and Lemuel and Sam you know, if we think of them as Joseph's brothers and the sons of Ishmael as the Whitmer brothers and Zoram as Oliver Cowdery, we see that they're all being encouraged to listen to Joseph, to listen to Nephi, because they're one and the same and they will be led to prosperity if they listen to that voice. And this is likely modelled after conversations that are happening in the Whitmer home in June of 1829 with Joseph and the Whitmer family, and also his own brothers, the Smith family, and also with Oliver Cowdery. 
And this all correlates with the language and the spirit of the Doctrine and Covenant sections that are being received for these people at the same time. So all of this points to Joseph being the author of these words. Now that we're in chapter 2 of 2 Nephi, we see Lehi addressing Jacob, who was his firstborn in the wilderness. This also has an autobiographical component to Joseph's life, because when the family moved from Vermont through to western New York in 1816, Joseph's parents were still having children, and of course they had two more children, Don Carlos and Lucy, in the wilderness in western New York, in their kind of fleeing from their homeland. And so these things actually happened to the Smith family. And these extra children were particularly hard for the Smiths. They were already poor. They moved with a lot of family and they needed all hands on deck. And so Lucy, with these small children in the wilderness, away from her family, that was very tough. And these older siblings took on some responsibility for looking after the younger siblings. And so Joseph, or Nephi, looking after his younger siblings is a really important thing in Joseph's life. In this chapter, Lehi talks to Jacob and talks about the gospel. Basically, it becomes a sermon, and this relates a lot of information about Christ and a number of phrases from the New Testament. And I just can't emphasize this enough that this is totally anachronistic. Imagine finding a text 600 years before Christ talking about Jesus Christ so specifically. This is just out of place and out of time in the history of the world. And so no one with any biblical knowledge will read any of these passages and think that this was from an ancient source. This is from a 19th century person talking about and backdating this information into the history of the world. And this chapter and sermon are really talking about 19th century Protestant Christian ideas that are in the milieu of Joseph Smith and how people are interpreting the Bible in his day. And he's making some clarifications. And in verse 17 and 18, he's talking about the devil, about Satan, and of course Satan didn't exist in 600 BC in the writings that were there. And if you go and listen to Dan McClellan, he can give you the history of Satan, but it, he certainly did not exist. This is something that became really a part of later Christianity, which has been backdated into the Old Testament. And this chapter has the famous scripture that we all know from seminary, which is Adam fell that men might be and men are that they might have joy. And this was always a bit of a favorite for me. But this assumes a literal Adam and Eve, which Adam and Eve is a creation narrative and it is totally figurative. But of course, in 19th century America and those who were looking at these Protestant Christian texts made these characters literal. This is a great comment by Austin, and I think it's really important in the Come Follow Me series to look at this issue, and that is the issue of translation. We seldom ask the question, what is the Book of Mormon? Because this underpins everything to do with the text. The Book of Mormon is often being compared to the Bible translation, and so let's have a look at what that means. When you're talking about translation, you're talking about three things. You need a source text, you need some expertise, and then thirdly, you will have some result, like a translation, a new text, based on the old text. When it comes to the Bible, we have these three things. In fact, we have a number of original texts, and these things are being discovered all the time, and so we've got multiple original texts. We have teams of people who are experts looking at these texts and discussing them and coming up with a translation, and then of course we have uh, translations of the Bible, and these have got better and better over time because newer source texts are coming in, because people are able to look at the original and discuss and understand the context and give a better arrangement. So this is changing vastly over time with the Bible. We don't have these things with the Book of Mormon. We don't have the source text because apparently this was taken back by the angel Moroni. 
we don't have an expert because we know that Joseph is a farm boy, so he's not an expert. And the only thing we really have is the translation, the parts of the original manuscript and then the printer's manuscript, which then dovetails into the text of the 1830 edition of the Book of Mormon. The only artifact we have from the translation process is this thing here, which is the seer stone. And this is the mechanism by which Joseph received the Book of Mormon. So if you're going to call Joseph a translator, what did he do? Was it his expertise with languages that allowed him to do this? Or was it his understanding and his working with seer stones in hats that allowed him to do this? And in which case, is that an expertise? Because we've never been able to quantify and qualify that particular expertise. And it's done purely with treasure seeking, which is completely debunked. So maybe the seer stone is the translating device, and Joseph is just a conduit. God is providing the text and the interpretation, and he's giving Joseph these words, which Joseph is just reciting. And the problem with that explanation is that everything that is in the modern Book of Mormon can be attributed to its 19th century creation date. So it's failing as a supernatural text to give us anything that's outside of Joseph's purview. This suggests that the Book of Mormon is not a translation, and Joseph is not a translator. So what is the Book of Mormon then? The text of the Book of Mormon shows that it's an oral performance done by Joseph in the moment. If there is any divinity in the Book of Mormon, it's done by inspiration through Joseph Smith's mind, which accounts for so much of the text, but it still means that it's not a translation. It can't possibly be a translation. And I get that there's a motivation to compare the Book of Mormon to the Bible in terms of translation, but this is just not possible. The Book of Mormon is something quite different, and we need to be honest about that as we evaluate it. Another thing to know about translation is that it's tricky because, of course, you've got the source material and you want to transfer it into something that somebody will read and understand. And things are not always transferable between languages and particularly time periods. So translators have to make a number of choices, including what words to use, what meanings to convey, and its intended audience so that it will be relevant to the reader. Consequently, when it comes to the Bible, there are different translations and they have different strengths and weaknesses depending on what the translator is trying to get across and how they do that. This could also mean that a translation may inherently have some anachronisms because what they're trying to convey may not be the original intent of the author, but it's the only way to convey it. And so a good translation will be able to tell you these kinds of things and the types of bias that are inherent in the text. And with source text, you can look at these biases and decide whether this is an accurate rendition of what was intended by the original authors. But with the Book of Mormon, we have no source text, and we don't even know if the gold plates were used during the translation process. Most of the time they were covered or out in the woods. They were not actually used. The seer stone is the only artifact we have that is related to the Book of Mormon. And this is a huge problem because other people had seer stones. Doctrine and Covenants 28 talks about Hiram Page, the Whitmer's son-in-law, who was a witness to the Book of Mormon, who also had a seer stone and was producing revelation that the Whitmer family and Oliver Cowdery totally believed in. So this wasn't just a thing that Joseph was doing. This was a thing that other people were doing too, and including faithful members of the church. And in Doctrine and Covenants 28, Joseph tells Hiram through revelation that what he's doing is the work of the devil, and it's not of God. So it's really difficult to quantify these things when you're talking about divinity and a rock in a hat that is giving you text. Joseph wanted to be believed, but what he produced and how he produced it has nothing to do with translation whatsoever. 
And so what Austin is doing here to compare the Bible to the Book of Mormon is totally invalid. It just can't be done. There is something you can take away though, and that is Joseph is producing the Book of Mormon for the kinds of people that are like him, particularly for New England refugees in Western United States who believed in this folk magic tradition, and those were its first converts. And then as it became more popular with people outside of that culture, he was able to adapt and move on from the Book of Mormon, and that's what happened in the Doctrine and Covenants and through into Nauvoo. But the best way to understand the Book of Mormon it is that it's from this Protestant New England refugee folk magic culture, and when you read the Book of Mormon in that regard, you get a lot more understanding of the text.